Welcome to the On The One podcast. This is the first ever episode and we're proud to bring you an interview with Steve Park, who talks to us about his new book, Picture in Prints, and his upcoming exhibition at the Proud Galleries in Camden. This was our first international interview and there were some technical hitches. The audio quality isn't quite what we'd like it to be, but we think it's worth listening to because of the great stories and insights that Steve shared with us. So, sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy. We'd like to welcome to the show Steve Park. Very honoured to have you as our first guest on our podcast for on the one dot We just want to remind people that um, Steve Park will be uh, doing an exhibition of his photos at the Proud Gallery in Camden from the 9th of November to the 3rd of December. Um, I'm Marcus. And I'm Alina. I'm Steve. Hey Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Great point. Steve, um, I've just uh, finished reading your book. It's so so great and really uh, a, a real heartwarming read for um, f- for us, you know, long long time fans of Prince, obviously. Um, you talked about your first gig with Prince when you were um, doing designs for the the floor of the Love Sexy show. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yeah, that was uh, yeah, it was the first thing that I got called out to do. I had no idea what I myself into uh but i i wasn't gonna pass up the opportunity so when they called and said could i do it i had enough uh background from um college because i was a theater major in painting sets for some of the uh, um shows that was like cool and, and everything because i knew i was gonna end up you know being prince at least i assumed so and i did and uh it was uh, a lot of, a lot of pressure but i just you know I just did it. I mean, that's kind of the way I try to approach things as much as I can. Like, you know, going in that it might be a lot to do, but you make the choice to say, I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it. Um, and so in this case, I said I'm going to do it. And uh, fortunately, the very quick design that I came up with, I had basically three hours uh, to do it to show Prince because he was getting ready to leave to go to, for three days. So I had to cobble together a design, that he, uh, which was amazing unto itself. And after that, it was all as much I possibly could in as quick a time as I could. So I took just three days and uh, ramped myself up on as many caffeinated beverages as I could. <laughs> so um, did you? Um, I, did Prince give you um, access to the music and things to listen to in order to inspire your designs, or did he give you some direction? Um, not in that particular case. No, he gave, he gave me nothing about a, uh, and it wasn't from him. It was from one of the working on the set. I got a sketch to the aerial of the stage, so to have thing to work with. But no, I uh, took it upon myself to run up Paisley Park and see what was in life, you know, out there. Uh, from things I saw um, around the studios to, I went up to the wardrobe department. That was a huge help. I saw kind of what, you know, his clothing was like, those giant button them to ear custom earrings and all the things that sort of were making up when well, I did check look at the um I think somebody copy like a, a proof of the album artwork at least the back I think the front of it I think the front of it was a little up in the air at that point because I seem to recall that initially the Love Sexy album was supposed to be a band fill the front which um I think many the band members were a little bit disappointed when they saw the final right. final cover, <laughs> <laughs> probably for a few reasons. <laughs> so, I don't think the, uh, fan, the lady fans were uh, too yeah, disappointed. So, so, yeah, I just sort of looked around for whatever inspiration I could find, and uh, fortunately, that all hit with him, you know, like for what he was looking. For. Cool. So I was watching the um, the glam slam video you mentioned in your book that that was your original design there. Um, yeah. So was that the, yeah. the with the basketball court and everything? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, I knew I knew that about him. I also um, because I don't think it was like maybe right away, but I, I had visited out to Paisley one time previously because Levi Caesar was a friend of mine, and he said you should come out. You know, Prince should be around this weekend. I was like, I was so excited, and then I went out and said left tap. So I was like, uh, but I got to look around Paisley, which was old, and I think I remember seeing that basketball back. 
Um, and I knew that Frank played basketball, so I thought so I thought it would be kind of cool to include that um, that part of it. And, and an interesting story to kind of go on that, by the way, was that uh, my first time visiting London um, was I came out to actually Birmingham Arena. He was playing out in Birmingham, and he was taking the sexy stage out to some um, festival dates. At the festival dates, they set everything up. They couldn't set stuff in the round. They had to be basically put up against a wall. Yeah. So you were missing half the stage. And um, he they flew me out. And this is, this is kind of awesome when I think about it. <laughs> they flew me out to Birmingham to paint Prince eyes on this big cloud backdrop. I just thought that was funny. Like, really? That's, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to argue with that, you know, to get me out to London. The funny part is I was uh, 25 and fairly ignorant of, um, of, of flying internationally. And so um, I knew that I came into Heathrow and that I flew to Birmingham. And when I came back, I was like, hey, I'm going to stay in London for a few days. So I, and, um, I didn't think about the fact that my ticket really would come into Heathrow and then leave to go back to the United States. I just stuck around. <laughs> so, so I uh, got to the airport and they're like, you were supposed to leave four days ago. I'm like, oh, uh, is, is, that, is that a problem? And they looked at it and they said, well, it's a full fare ticket, so no, it's not. But I'm like, I don't think you could get away with that today. That was pretty uh, – I, I, I don't know how I made that decision in my head that that was an okay thing, but I didn't get away with it, I guess. So um, turned out turned out okay in the end. That's brilliant. <laughs> um one of the like a few times in the book you talk about um time that you and prince spent together um like jamming listening to music and and things like that and um there was one story that which really made me laugh w about when he um was kind of trash talking other artists <laughs> like yeah. sting that really that really made me chuckle um were there any um times when you had played him something and like he really got into it and you mentioned a few in the book but were there any that stand out that you where you felt like oh he's like kind of taking an influence from what you were playing um i'd say that him react to the most strongly well because one was when i played him no doubt he had not heard no doubt at that point and and i didn't necessarily recognize how much he got into it until one night he called me down uh to the kitchen where there's a tv down there and he'd watch david letterman pretty much every night and a lot of times he would be like oh hey so-and-so's letterman tonight come down later or whatever but this night he called me he says hey come down and we're sitting there and no doubt was performing um and she and uh went to funny hopped up on dave's desk and was you know uh singing right to him from the desk and all and prince mm -hmm. loved that man he got so excited to see that he's like you know he's like clapping his hands being like yeah that's what i do you know so um and then then he Later, uh, No Doubt was in town. He's like, hey, we're going to see No Doubt with me. I'm like, all right. I mean, you know, with a couple other people. It wasn't just me and him. But uh, yeah, yeah, of course I do. And then and then the, the big payoff for me, which I had no expectation of, which I, I wrote about, I think, a little bit in the book, was that we came back basically later with my expectation of working because often that's the way things went. Like, you know, yeah, you get to have a little fun, but now it's time to go back to work. Yeah. Um, and instead, he showed up with with most of the band of no doubt and sat around jamming for like an hour and a half and i was like the only other person there it wow. was great <laughs> it was great um and another person he really we, we listened to a lot of music too that was stuff we grew up with and we talk about like oh i haven't heard that album in a while so we would kind of listen to that um we got into like uh, there was a series where we were listening to a lot of weather report and uh and return to forever which were you know big uh uh jazz uh, fusion band from the like, 70s early 80s um and that's just before he really got into doing like news and um uh the one night alone piano record so i think oh, yeah. he was kind of you know listening to that stuff again for sort of like oh yeah this is what i liked about that and all that um, but he really got into victor wooten uh, who i've had the pleasure to work with for uh several years uh, who's an amazing bass player, I'd say, you know, one of the best out there. And um, I made him a, a record, you see, and he's like, um, is he in a band? And that, it was the kind of question that was like, I'd like to be in my band <laughs> <laughs> kind of uh, thing. And I said, well, no, he's in a band. And he said, you know, like, well, you know, what do they sound like? Do you have something? And I didn't. And, and uh, he's in a band called Bale Fleck and the Flecktones. 
for anyone who's not familiar with Flintstones, they're, they're definitely different. I mean, they're, they're, they're very typical, um, like, you know, like music theory and things like that. People play it all playing in different time, times, you know, yeah. and yet make it work. Yeah. Um, it's that kind of a bit. It's like, it's like watching, you know, gymnastics with like, everybody doing a different routine and yet somehow they all work together. Uh, and Bill Fleck is a, is a world-class musician. He's an banjo player, but he plays all kinds of stuff. Like he, when you say banjo player, people expect one thing. Yes, he does do bluegrass, but he does all kinds of things. And um, um, Victor's brother, Future, and plays this drum guitar that he made himself. Like he built this thing that he played drums on. It's like a, a mechanical thing, but he still plays, you know, a kit. Sometimes he'll play a kit with one hand. And I'm just trying to give you an idea of like how, yeah. how crazy these guys are. Um, you know, the Wooten brothers themselves, uh, all the talent music. You know, uh, Reggie would play two saxophones at the same time. I mean, it's wow. just. <laughs> how good they are so i brought i brought in this bailing the flick tones and the first song starts off, i started from the beginning the first song starts off with banjo and immediately hopped up and just flipped it to the song <laughs> just the banjo was not doing it for him <laughs> so he, li he listens for a minute and it was one of those songs where everybody's playing a different time signature and uh, you know I, I think he just didn't expect that because victor's records are, fu are more funk driven i would say that yeah. Definitely the group obvious, you know. Uh, there's a groove in flat tones, but it's not necessarily, you know, quite as, you know, clean as you would think from from a face. And uh, he just looked at me and he said, you know, do, do they want to play like that? Which I thought was funny, you know, like, well, what do you think? <laughs> but but I think, I mean, looking back on it, I sort of thought to myself, well, you know, I know he's self-taught and he's an amazing musician, mm -hmm. but there is a difference between someone like, you know, even like. Let's say in the classical world, you know, if someone has classical training, someone who plays and who's amazing but doesn't have that training, I think is going to look at that and kind of be like, oh, man, I wish I had that, even if they don't want to admit it or even if they don't need it, frankly, even if it's not necessary for what they do, yeah. there's going to be some of that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's like other artists, other photographers I see where I'm like, oh, I wish I was doing that, even though yeah. I'm perfectly happy to do what I do. There's always that little like, how, how does that happen? And, mm -hmm. you know, but in his case, I think he was like, yeah, I don't even, I don't even, I, this is too hard for me. Like, and, and I don't think it really was. I just think it was kind of made more comfortable because, you know, it's something he's going like, okay, I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can repeat that. And I want to be able to, um, and, 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 and on that note, I will say this, just another side note about that was that just recently I was talking with uh, Victor Wooten's manager um, who told me, because I told her that story, and she goes, well, it's funny. Um, Prince had asked Victor and his band to come out and play at one of the celebrations. Mm. And um, so, uh, you know, which I, I went really well. Victor really liked doing it. It was fun for them. And uh, Danette, his manager, told me recently that you know, it's funny one morning I was – in the morning after the performances, she was going to get some gear and make sure the gear was being taken care of. Apparently. And she walked past a room and she looked in and she noticed Prince sitting there, but she didn't say anything. She was just ready to walk by. And Prince saw her and just said, oh, hey, come on in, you know. So she came in and he was talking to her about, you know, like, hey, thanks for coming out. I'm glad everybody came. I hope you had a good time. You know, very, just like, you know, kind of very welcoming and gracious. But she noticed that he was, he had taped the performance of Victor and his band and his brother, Reggie, who had taught Victor, taught everybody, and is a, this, again, crazy guitar player, like you, you've never seen anything like. He said, she told me that Prince was like looping him playing back and forth, watching his technique. Yeah. Yeah. And I just find that really interesting because it just goes to show, you know, there's a guy that, you know, at, at the top of any of his instruments, I think, is as good as anybody else, but he's never satisfied with that he's he's constantly trying to kind of improve himself and yeah. find other ways to express himself and you know I, just just as a, a side note to all the things we talk about with listening to music is that you know he was listening to it not just from an enjoyment standpoint just with all, like picking things out and you know kind of making ideas or thoughts about you know for himself uh which i think is pretty cool you know so there was a reason I, I did that circuitous thing, by the way. I was bringing it back to your question. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really interesting insight because, you know, we hear quite a lot over the years about um, Prince calling out different artists to come and jam with him. You know, like you hear the Dave Grohl talking the the story about inviting him out to Paisley Park to jam, and it just gives a different perspective on it. You know, maybe it's because he 
admired these people and thought that he could learn from them as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, he definitely had, you know, you know, people that he worked over time, like Larry Graham, as an example. I mean, yeah. you know, it was it was obvious to me when he was playing with Larry, he was just having a great, you know, really love, because that's the music, he, you know, he grew up on a lot of that music. And I mean, how, how cool is it to be able to basically sit there and jam with your own idols and interviews there, um, with scholarship, you know, having your label and, and contribute to that. It's going to be pretty amazing, you know, and I think that that's, that's something that's very much like, you know, watching can speak fan is kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, hi, Steve. Um, Hello. Just thinking about what you're saying and that we know Prince was a very private person. Um, um, did you feel he opened up quite a bit with you with his train of thought and who he liked and, didn't like in terms of music. I mean, we get insights, you know, with some of this in your book. But do you feel he he was more open with you than than others in terms of his um, his thinking and the way he thought about musicians? Um, I think he was. I'd say he was more open with me, maybe a different way, um, because I didn't. I wasn't uh, fit into exactly where, what he or who he worked with on a daily. basis. I wasn't a musician. Um, I wasn't a, a staff member who did like the sort of did stuff for him. Uh, um, you know, so those those relationships were all very different. Um, I can't speak to what I mean. I know he talked to other people. I mean, I know you know people would be like, "Oh no, I, we just had like an hour conversation." So he talked to people. Um, you know, I can't obviously say what they talked about, but mm -hmm. I do think that, you know, I had a different relationship with him because I was doing something that for him, it was something I think that, you know, until he brought um, art in house, uh, you know, just prior to me, he had somebody out there. I think it sort of gave him a different, like, Hey, now I can control my image more and I can control my sort of how I want things to look and have more input and more say to say, you know, brothers basically here's a bunch of different art i mean yeah may have had you know, rights to refusal and all that but they're sort of doing it there and then back and forth as opposed to him being in on the ground floor so um and with the photography you know the fact that i came along at a time that digital photography was a reality um even if it was still in its infancy he had an opportunity to start looking at himself um and try things on, like, you know, one of the things I, I have said is that, you know, I, I started to realize that part of what we were doing half the time was he got a, something in his head about, I want to see what this outfit looks like on me. Mm -hmm. And we would just shoot him and he could look at it. And if he didn't like it, we just erase all the images. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it, that's pretty convenient. Um, it comes to that. So in that, I think that what I would say that he had a different relationship with me than maybe the, the way other relationships were out there. And we... I definitely, you know, I I can't say whether he was surprised or not surprised by the fact that I had a pretty good musical background. I could I could speak about music without being a musician. That makes sense because yeah. mm. I listened to so much of it. Yeah. So I so I could articulate my thoughts on it, but I wasn't from the I you hear play B flat instead of a Mr. Met off right. Yeah. Oh, that's him, man. I was more like, oh, this is an awesome record. And he's like, yeah, it is. <laughs> or, hey, check this out. Like, this out. You know, it was like that. So I always joke, like, we were just a bunch of, you know, two big music geeks sitting around listening to music sometimes, you know. Mm. Um, and then on top of that, yeah, he would he would just talk to me about things, you know, sort of, it, it depended on the day, you know, but we, we had many, multiple hour discussions about all kinds of things, you know, just kind of weaving in and out of, Whatever was going on, you know, in the on the world front, or just uh, you know, a couple sometimes in his personal life, you know, it, it just depended on, um, you know, it just kind of depended on the, um, I don't know, depending on the day, I guess, you know. Yeah, no. uh, yeah it's like, like I said, I don't want to say, I guess I don't want to say, you know, a, a completely unique relationship. Think that we had our own, um, you know, kind of interpersonal relationship, and uh, and I'm certainly grateful for that. Did you did you get a feel for his? religious views um pouring into the work and the in the artistry that that he wanted you to produce did you feel there was a lot of influence from his his change in his religious perspective over time uh as far as the artwork goes yes um uh i don't I mean, he he always had little things underneath um 
you know, whether they whether they followed through or not, um, you know, I mean, sometimes you'd be really whimsical about the artwork. Like I'd say, like the uh, New, New Power Soul uh, album is a good example. Like it was dead whimsical, you know, kind of fun bunch stuff we did with the record. Um, and I think he saw the album that way too, you know. So that, yeah, a, that that kind of had a real whimsical feel to it. But I think it depended on kind of where he was in his head and how he felt about things. Um, and for, you know, a good example to me was like a very direct example was, you know, when he was doing the Holy River video, um, you know, he definitely had some, I would say, spiritual uh, kind of visuals within that you know, way he approached uh, explaining some things about his life a little bit and, and how, I don't know, how he was thinking. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. Let me let me mess around with it. And I picked up that one painting, but honestly, the digital format wasn't great for that yet. The Photoshop is still pretty, pretty plastic, in my opinion, um, and how it rendered when you painted and drew. But there's a set of there's really early filters. I did a decent paint, paint effect, and I ran this paint effect on it, and he, he loved it. And, and basically, he said, you know, yeah, give him a print out, and I came back, and he said, at Picture influence. Welcome to the dawn. Sorry, it was the flip side of Holy. Yeah, walk the dawn. No, I, I got say, oh, yeah, no, I'm saying, imagine, you know, having someone walk into your room, putting a cassette in, paint it for you, and being welcome to the dawn, and being like, just kind of blowing your socks off, and then, and then going, you know, pointing to pick you give them this book, me write a song. You know? Yeah, that's mind blowing. Like I've, got, I've got to say, like the the truth is one of my favorite albums, and Welcome to the Dawn is one of my favorite songs. So that's mm. that's got to be uh, yeah, pretty mind blowing. <laughs> oh no, absolutely no, and I and I have to say it's one of the ones that I have to say. Well, one of my favorite stories about that was um, when they ever put that out, the big design, and they were put a package on the fall. We, we had a whole package design just for that album. I really liked it a lot. I'm really, really happy with it. And uh, and uh, so I was like, there was a little bit of inspiration on my end thinking, I really want this to come out. At the same time, I, it really was me loving that record and wanting other people to hear it. And I felt like, yeah, it's going to get buried in that crystal ball thing because, yeah. you know, fans will, fans will spend the money because yeah. they won't want the crystal ball. But an average person who's like, well, I don't, I don't know what that is. And it's more money than a regular record. It's three C, whatever, four yeah. CDs. This that that Truth record, and um, so I said to him, I said, uh, "Hey, <laughs> this be maybe a little bald, and, and sometimes sometimes it paid off. Others so much. This is one weird enough. But I said, um, have you thought about maybe taking Truth and Package separately and making it like five ninety nine, or if you buy the Crystal Ball, you get it for free." So you know you get the same, you're getting the same deal basically. But yeah. you kind of like, I mean, you just goes, uh, you should stick to uh, art. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. So, but anyway, and then the funny, the irony of me a little bit that was a few months later, I remember I was, uh, listening to music in my room, and it was the Truth album because, I, like I said, I really liked it, so I would actually play that there. And he walked in, and he's standing there for a few minutes. He goes. Hmm, this really is a good record, and I'm like, yeah, it really is. I was kind of pointed in making that, you know, <laughs> that, that Yes, in fact, it is. Um, I think that's one of the tough things. I think that someone who produced as much as he does, and all the mentally sort of moved on to the next thing, yeah, or artistic moving next thing, it was difficult for him to probably see value in what he's finished doing because he was done with it. Yeah, you didn't get paid. For you. There we go. Hey, we're back. <laughs> yeah, so things are being things are being extra laggy. I like to, you know, so I'm always reminded, like, thank, I'm thankful for the technology, but I'm, I'd be more thankful if it worked better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, where were we? You were talking about... Oh, um... uh, I was talking about uh, the, uh, the other album that I thought got a little bit lost in the mix, too, um... Because my son, who's 17, is like really, really into uh, the Exodus record. Oh, and, uh, I, love that. I, I love that record when it came out. I mean, I remember, you know, friends would play it for us and we were working on the artwork and everything. And yeah. I was like, this is awesome. When people hear this, this is going to kill it. And then he put it out, you know, in NPG, which unfortunately for, you know, people, you know, one of the things I learned working for him and, and from working for um, with some of the record labels like Arista and people like that, yeah. it definitely is the case that when 
someone recognizes you as an artist that and they like you they're going to buy you and if they don't get that they're not necessarily going to give it a chance you know it's like it's like putting out a new artist all over again and i think that especially in those early days where the new power generation was kind of still not a solidified what is that you know it's like not prince in the new power generation really but kind of but whatever and then the whole torah torah thing i think it just you know i think it did well from what i can tell it did very well overseas but people in the united states didn't even know about it and mm. i would play that for people and they'd be like oh yeah that's like the funkiest thing i've ever heard who is that and yeah. i'm like well it's this new power generation i mean but you know clearly prince is all over it and they're like wow i wish i'd known about this and i'm like yeah i know that's it's mm. it is tough you know so that was just goes back to what i was saying a little bit about sometimes you know he he does these projects where for him they they are almost like you know like i don't know i don't i don't want to say he i definitely don't ever want to say he just tosses them off because mm-hmm. i don't think he does i don't think he just kind of goes oh you're up to this record I, I, he works hard at it but i will say that you know for someone who's got that ability to continuously output like he did one of the things that happens is i think that you know it's like i don't know it's like hearing all this music and never hearing something over again um and it's like even though you enjoy hearing all that music it's hard to pick out a favorite it's hard to pick out something because you've only heard it once and you would like to go back and hear it again but you don't ever have the opportunity yeah so you're kind of like on to the next thing you know like as a listener Mm -hmm. um that's the way i feel about it and um so you know it's 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 not having uh the opportunity to to have its own life because suddenly something else comes up you know that type of thing so um several of his projects i felt that way about but you know like i said it's it's his they're all his babies we do with him what he wants you know that's that's kind of the way it comes down do you feel he ever looked back on some of the old photographs and the old artwork and told you how he felt about it or did he look at the new stuff in terms of you mean um no uh, we we talked i mean like we talked about the 1999 album once just because uh we were sitting um where were we we were in the game room i think which used to be the old wardrobe room and he had up a couple miles davis paintings that miles davis had given him right. and he said yeah miles is like a really good painter and blah 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 and he goes you know who else was really good and i said who and he said denise was really good and i was like for a minute it took me a minute to realize he was talking about you know denise matthews he said yeah she did the 1999 album cover and i was like really <laughs> i was just kind of like huh Okay, I kind of always wondered that. He was just very casual about it and, mm. and said that. But honestly, I don't. The only time he ever referenced a record cover to me, from a make it look like standpoint, um, I worked with him briefly on the Lotus Flower packaging. Um, I didn't end up doing the final pieces because he he went a different direction, which is fine. Um, I uh, but I was working on the uh, MPLS album, and he told me directly. He said I wanted to look like 1999 part two mm. you know and, and kind of put some art together like that and i did i put some stuff together like that and he really liked it i mean he was really into it but you know again the, the whole packaging went a different direction you know for whatever for whatever reason and which was fine but that's the only time i remember him ever sort of looking back and saying i want this to feel like a continuation usually everything was about like something different something new you know um you know, that, that's exactly what I got from him. Um, as I, interestingly enough, only because somebody recently asked me about this, you know, um, I did the Graffiti Bridge album cover also. I painted that. Yeah. And somebody said, oh, well, you know, what did he tell you? And I said, um, oh, he told me he liked it. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I just painted that. I, I, as it, it just happened. I mean, I painted it because I was looking to expand my portfolio of paintings to show to art directors because I'd already worked for Prince, but I thought maybe that was going to be it. Like I had like a little gap while he was on tour and I thought, what if he comes back and I don't get any more work? I, I want to be prepared for something else. So I painted it, of course, putting him in it because I'm like, well, then I can show it to him. If he likes it, maybe he'll hire me to do something like that. Like mm-hmm. I never suspected he would decide that that was going to be the album cover, you know, because I didn't, I hadn't, first of all, I had never heard the record. Mm-hmm. I didn't know they were making a movie. <laughs> I didn't know any of that stuff, you know, wow. it was just sort of like, uh, you know, it, it was probably at the very beginning of that whole process where I started painting it. And um, Levi Caesar gave him a transparency of it that I had sent for him to show him. 
And uh, he said that he had it at his desk every single day looking at it. Wow. And he thinks he's going to do something with it. Well, I mean, you know, you, you never want to get too excited <laughs> until something happens. And uh, one day he, Prince called me and just said, you know, I want this to work. And um, we need to put Ingrid Chavez in. We need to put Morris Day in. And can we make the woman at the bottom look like um, Jill Jones? And um, so I did. I mean, it was an original painting, which meant I had to actually sand the surface of the painting down and repaint back into it, which was, I'd never done that before. But again, I, like I said early on, it's just one of those things like, okay, I'm going to do it. Like I, what, what else am I going to do? You know what I mean? Steve, like I'm going to do it or not do it. And I did it. And, uh, ended up, you know, using it for the cover, which was great. And for the, you know, pieces of it for the movie poster. So, uh, but that was an awesome call because he called and chatted with me a bit and at the very end of it. He just he just said to me he said I'm very proud of you and I was like wow that yeah. that's amazing so so it's interesting you know talking about how much input he had I mean there definitely were projects we worked on where you know he was very specific about what he wanted or very specific about the mood of the record um, like um, the um, you know, I'm blanking on the name of the record I'm seeing it in my head uh, the last one for last one for Warner Brothers. Uh, and chaos and disorder. There we go. He he he, he said, uh, you know, I need you to work on this package for Warner Brothers. I said, okay. Mm. And he goes, um, I want it to look like a dead dog in the middle of the street. <laughs> and then he stopped. But, but he stopped and he said, but not actually a dead dog in the middle of the street. I said, okay. <laughs> so I got I got what he wanted, but he didn't want literally want that. So yeah. you know. Um, so that was a very it was very specific and, and very not specific at the same time. It was like, okay, now I have to interpret what you mean by that exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a real feeling um, there. <laughs> yeah. Was that um, so, uh, his footprint on the uh Yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. And again, that was a very interesting thing to do because, you know, it's hard for people to sometimes understand, especially contemporarily, you know, like, well, why wouldn't you take your phone and take pictures? It's because they didn't exist. They yeah. <laughs> didn't exist. That whole record, uh, the artwork for that was made primarily of Polaroid photos, a little bit of stock photography and scanning things like I scanned a cop, uh, I scanned the bottom of Maite's boot for that boot print. Oh, cool. I scanned a, uh, I scanned a, the label, uh, from that record and then of course I changed it enough to not make it you know because I mean technically that's a Warner Brothers thing yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I made it a little different but uh, it was it was things like that you know you you had to make do with what you had so I, I had a flatbed scanner I had Polaroid cameras mm -hmm. um, which I could then scan the Polaroids um, I, I had you know some of that stuff on the inside I was like wow I went kind of over the top with some of that but it was it was kind of fun I I literally took a pile of um, dead flowers and, and poured lighter fluid on them and lit them outside oh in God. the snow. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it was, it was fun. I kind of had free reign at that point to do what I wanted. And, uh, I just took advantage of it. I, I scanned his Bible, um, for the inside artwork. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was interesting because it was very much a do it yourself kind of scenario there because, you know, a lot of the technology isn't what it is today. You know, people, I think, so I'm glad I came up at a time where you had to invent things, I guess, in, in a way. Yeah. Um, everything wasn't easy. And I, and I don't mean ideas are easy. I don't you know, mean to say that people don't work hard. I'm just saying, like, there's an awful lot of things you can do pretty easy now. You can take a really good quality photo with your phone, one that you can use for print, one that you can use for, you know, social media advertising, all that stuff. That didn't exist. You know, it just wasn't a thing. And mm. so um, it made you get creative. And so I'm grateful to that because it kind of makes you, you know, even today, I will think outside the box. I'm not afraid to think, well, if I didn't have all of these tools, what would I do? You yeah. know, yeah. Um, which I think is I think is kind of important. So, um, but yeah, but, but, but kind of back to what you asked, too, about whether he ever pointed back to things with photos with with the photos. um, the only conversation that ever came up about old photos was when he asked me, uh, which I put, I talk about in the book about why, why people think he had a nose job. Oh, yeah. And, um, and that was interesting. Yeah, and that's me. Yeah. Well, that was because he, apparently that's something he heard or read, or I don't know how he got there, but I said, uh, I said, well, I can tell you if you want to know. And the only reason I say that is because, you know, sometimes he'd say something like that. And then you realized, oh, that's a rhetorical question. You don't actually want to know the answer. To that. <laughs> you start <laughs> launching into it and see him just kind of looking at you like, oh, no, OK, you don't really want an answer. All right. So I said, I can answer that if you want to know. And he said, yeah. 
And I said, well, uh, if you look back at your early records, um, most of your photography was done. You look very straight at the camera. And it was true. When he looked straight at the camera, the ball on his nose was more apparent, which gave his nose a very different shape than if he lowered his head at a slight angle and looked out from under his eyes. His, his nose is very angular from the side. And so you get that three quarter down thing. Suddenly his nose looks very angular, whereas straight on, it definitely has a more organic kind of ball shape at the tip of the, the end of his nose. So we shot the photos um, with some photos we did for, um, they ended up, because again, a lot of times we didn't do them for things. We just did them, and then they ended up places. Uh, uh, ended up in Guitar Player magazine, and then also uh, the Mill City Music Festival poster, um, and also I think in the calendar. So there's some shots of him where he's very definitively looking straight at the camera, head up, and all that. And it was simply because he sort of wanted to see that, and was like, "Oh yeah, you're right," you know. So you know, fortunately, from years of drawing, I, I had a really good sense of why, you know, how things change. It's it's kind of one of my, I have to be honest, one of my pet peeves with um, Facebook sometimes when people look at things and go, oh, look how much their face has changed or look how this, it's like, it's a different angle, different lighting and a different lens. <laughs> I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, but you know, but that's again, it's because you know it. It's like, it's because I know it uh, um, from what I do. So, um, you know, I, I, I get that not everybody's going to have that knowledge. So I try not to be snarky about it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Steve, I've got some questions here um, that other fans have sent in to us. Sure. Um, so uh, this is one um, just asking about the artistic process. Um, mm -hmm. um, did Prince give you an idea and then let you run with it? Or was it very structured in terms of like, did he literally kind of look at look at what you were doing while you were doing it and like have the final say on it? Or did he just leave you to do your thing? Um, it just depended. I mean, honestly, he, he, uh, sometimes gave me an idea, come and he'd check on it once in a while, you know, and, uh, he would, you know, he'd be like, uh, is there anything for me to see? He'd call from like a lot of times from the studios cause he'd be working on an album or, or, or music. I don't want to say an album necessarily, but music. Mm -hmm. And he'd just say, is there anything to see? And I, he'd say, yeah, sure. Come up. And he'd look and he'd give some feedback. Sometimes it would be like, no, oh, that's all good. Other times like, mm, I think we should go another direction. I mean, um, and, other, and there are times where he would like, you know, all night long while I'm working on something, he was literally over my shoulder the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> and talk about like, you know, talk about performance anxiety, you know, I mean, <laughs> basically it's like, okay, look, when you're working on something, you make mistakes. I mean, you put something somewhere and you go, no, that's not it. Yeah. He'd see me put it there and go, I don't know if I like that. It's like, well, in my head, I'm going, oh, I don't know if I like that either. I'm just trying it out. <laughs> but, but you're trying to like, okay, so what I have to now do is not move anything until I eyeball it a little bit and see where I think it might go best so that at least I feel like I'm. it's in the ballpark if he's going to give me feedback, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but while we're doing that, we would be chatting about other things. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like he was there for the process, sometimes very engaged, and other times he might be really wanted to chat about other things, but it just so happened I was doing my job at the same time he wanted to chat about things, you know, like that. Yeah. So uh, there was no one way or the other approach to it. Um, you know, the photography thing was, hey, grab your camera, we're going to go out and do this, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes that resulted in something really great. Other times we didn't end up using anything out of what we shot, you know, um, I think usually we use one or two things, but it just, you know, there were ones that were way more successful, I guess, in his head, like what what he wanted out of it um yeah so it so yeah structure absolutely not <laughs> absolutely zero structure one time i remember he came in and he said uh, we need a we need an ad i think for i don't know if it was for a record probably for a record we need an ad for this i said what size he goes all the sizes all right well that's not helpful that's not helpful so basically it's like i will make this thing as big as i possibly can and as generalized as I possibly can. And then when I get a call for like what size it actually is, I have enough leeway to move things around. And yeah. I know I've started with an image that's big enough. And, you know, it's just funny. And I kind of to that day, to this day, rather, um, I, I have that tendency. Like if, if I don't know what somebody's going to use something for, I will make an image as big as it can be. And then I end up with these gigantic files because, <laughs> oh, we're only using that for like a quarter page ad. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh. Okay, you can, this could be a billboard. All right, that's fine. I'll <laughs> you know, make it smaller. But, but, you know, you don't know. You just don't. I, I was just recently working on uh, Sheila E's current record, 
And same thing, like I, I built the images for the cover uh, artwork bigger and even for her, her single because, you know, the process was not 100 percent, you know, like this is what it's going to be. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to make sure that I was working with things big enough that if she really liked something, then, hey, you want to turn that into a poster? Not a problem. And as a matter of fact, in the end, it worked in my favor because um, I did a cover for the, I guess, I guess, digital single of America. And um, I quite liked the way that image came out. And I thought it's a shame that's all it's for. Well, in the end, we ended up using that for the vinyl. And it's like uh, mm-hmm. the whole image stretches the front and the back of the vinyl. So I was really happy that, you know, that kind of lesson I learned to make things flexible yeah. um, paid off, you know. So so it, do, it does pay off. But like I said, it does also end up like you're like, well, I need some massive terabyte backups and i gotta tell you back then you know again it's one of those perspective things you didn't have terabyte backups you had to be very conscientious of your size of of, of files because storage was very expensive even even for for anybody you know and like i said we were a little bit of a a a bit of a diy diy there we go do it yourself diy (laughs) kind of situation there you know people wouldn't think that i i think that's what's so funny is people wouldn't think that about paisley park they think it was way more um you know set up like a a regular art department and i think maybe it got that way eventually Mm. uh, maybe maybe not but it, it was always a little bit flying by the seat of your pants at all times um and just trying to trying to hold on you know yeah. uh, as you went right. and uh which made it very exciting but it also made it sometimes you know honestly in the final final assessment of like what you did you're like man i wish i had more time on that i wish i had a little more this or i wish things had gone this way but you know mm-hmm. I, I think that's true even if you're given every possible uh um uh, opportunity to make it right there's always something that in the end you're like oh how did i miss this you know yeah um yeah so anyway so yeah the process was was probably about the same way prince did music the difference was i didn't have a bunch of people when i was done to fix it up for me like you know do all the all the tech work i had to do all the tech work too (laughs) prince is known for his um great and wicked sense of humor what was the funniest thing you ever saw him do or say uh, I mean, there were a lot of things like with the band. I mean, he and the band would just cut up like crazy a lot of times when I would see them, you know, working. And it was, it was, it would be hard to say what the funniest thing was within that. But for me personally, uh, within like my office, I think the funniest thing was always that when, whenever he would answer to the phone in my office, because the sound, the system was set up so that it would go to the um, front desk in the building, you know, because it was a commercial building I and mean, it was set up to be a commercial building. So it would ring at the front desk at late at night, and then it would, um, you could pick it up from any office if you knew the code. Now, I forgot the code all the time. I was supposed to answer it, but I forgot the code. <laughs> but he knew it. He knew the code, and he would pick it up. And if it was ringing directly into my office, I was like, oh, no, that's probably somebody I know. And it was funny because he would pick it up and be like, oh, it's for you. And I'm like, uh, I'll, I'll call you back. But um, <laughs> But he would pick it up and start these routines about how, you know, like obviously someone on the other end was, you know, looking for quote unquote looking for Prince, and he he'd just be like, well, no, we we don't see Prince through here very much. You know, he he's on the road and he's doing all these things, and it's hilarious. Oh my god, because I mean, you sitting there telling the person, yeah, and he is Prince, and he's Prince, <laughs> but he'd kind of do these like Midwestern accents. He he'd answer it like you know, saying, uh, you know, oh, uh, what kind of pizza can I get you? You know, like what, what do you want? What toppings do you want? You know, like that. <laughs> it was really funny, and. and the thing that, that got me the most was that the more I was trying not to laugh too hard because I was trying to let him do his thing. And if, if someone laughing in the background, it would be obviously like, you know, yeah. kids playing a practical joke. So I tried not to. But the more I tried to not laugh, the harder he would work whatever bit he was doing. It was <laughs> it was really funny. So, you know, he yeah, that's that's that is true. He he can be really, really funny. And like I said, a lot of it's like, you know, if you have a friend of yours who's funny, Sometimes you're like, well, I can't, I, I can't tell you everything they did. It's just you, you, you were in the moment for it, and you're like, yeah. oh my god, that was hilarious. Yeah. You may not remember what he did, but the phone thing was funny because even though I can't remember every single version of what he did, he yeah. did it on a regular basis. Um, anytime he was sitting with me, and it just, it was so funny to watch him, man. He just grabbed that phone and be right on it. Um, you know, I guess if he was in the mood, he was ready to roll. You know, yeah. So it was very, very funny. I love the idea that there are people now reading your book realizing that actually they were speaking to Prince all that time. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, my, my friends of mine who would call me, 
uh, you know, cause I told people, I said, look, if you want to call me, call me a little later because, you know, I'll probably be working during the day and, you know, I could, I could chat or whatever a little later, um, while I'm working. And, uh, when he'd answer, he'd answer Steve's office, which was funny. And then, and then if they said, you know, like, Oh, Steve there, and, and, and inevitably they'd be like, Hey, was that Prince? I'm like, no, I gotta go. Gotta go. Bye. <laughs> you know, it's like, later I'd be like, yes, yes, it was. <laughs> I'm not going to sit there and say it on the phone in front of him, you know? <laughs> Especially, frankly, when it was like, well, I can't even say it's Prince right now. It's, yes. It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Prince has shown a bit of an interest in photography himself. So we've seen a few photos, you know, of him with a camera. Did he ever, like, get tips from you or anything like that? Or did he just do all that stuff by himself? Well, I, he did all that stuff by himself. I mean, I, I'd hand him the camera ready to go like a few times, you know, he wanted to, he's got a couple pictures of, of Maite that he took that are really pretty. Um, so he, yeah, he had a good eye. He had a really good eye. And I think it just was a matter of, you know, like, um, you know, a, again, you know, I don't want to overemphasize it, but the, the cameras back then were a little on the iffy side as far as, you know, getting a good shot out of it. You kind of had to, he had to tweak it a little bit as you went, but um, he got some he got some really nice stuff out of it. And then I have seen things since. But I, yeah, I've always thought he's had a great eye. Like he would he would sometimes be looking through a magazine and say, you know, I want to crop that like this. And I look at it and go, yeah, you're right. You know, I, I see what you're after. So he he really he devoured that stuff visually. I think he would look through uh, magazines. I mean, we never we never did it exactly. I mean, like, he never shared with me anyway. Like, hey, see this photo? I want to do something like this. But I think that he was always interested in. You know, both fashion, which, you know, involved a lot of photography, obviously, and um, and just kind of visual style. Like I said, from what I saw him do or talk about, I had a good sense that he he knew composition well, and he kind of got a feel for what he wanted out of lighting. So it's it's almost like it, it, I, there's nothing I could tell him more than re really, I mean, literally spend more time with the camera if he wanted to, to keep doing it. That's all. I mean, because he had a good eye for it. Like, just like anybody I've taught before, and there are people who, you know, you're like, I don't have to tell you anything um, other than, you know, sort of like watch for a couple of small things, but you've got a great eye and, and then other people need, really need to know, they, they don't inherently know it, you know, and you can learn it um, and you do need to give people tips in that case. But uh, yeah, he's just one of those people. I never, I never saw his, him as someone who needed that. And yeah. he certainly never asked me. So I wasn't, I wasn't going to volunteer that information. <laughs> <laughs> what was your, um, it must, it must be difficult to, to pick one out, but, what would you say was your biggest wow moment working with Prince? Um, hmm. You know, well, I uh, probably my biggest, I, I think there were two. And the biggest obvious one was probably the first time he ever called me into the studio. And I thought, well, you know, here's something, something he doesn't like. He's calling me into the studio. And in fact, he just called me down to listen to what he was doing and to watch what he was doing. And and so here's a guy showing me what he does, showing me his artistry, like up close and personal. Mm. And it's got a guy who I've been a huge fan of since I was a teenager, you know. And, and just to sit there and watch this guy laying down a guitar track while he's chatting with me at the same time. And, and of course, you can keep all, you need to keep all that stuff internal. You can't be like, you know, like I, I didn't want to be like crying and fanning my eyes at the same time while this was happening. <laughs> I thought I'd never get that opportunity again if I did that. So, yeah. but inside I was doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that was amazing. It was amazing. And, 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 and to, to go with that probably anytime he's hopped up on stage just to watch that transition from the guy I was literally just chatting with to this just force of nature, just, powering his way through his craft was amazing you know mm -hmm. blew me away but uh, at the same time the other thing that probably did that for me but in a very different way um was probably the the shoots out at uh the shoot we did out at chanhas and uh, arboretum mm. because i was really spending time with this guy in 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 such a different uh atmosphere and different mm -hmm. vibe out there and um, we, well, we got out there twice. We went out once with Larry Graham. We were shooting with him and that was more Prince kind of saying like, Hey, and, and there's a case where he was a little bit art directing on it. Like his things he wanted for Larry's record, you know, he'd say, try this, try this. Um, but then when we went out, you know, and even then it was really nice. It was just nice 
I don't know, being outside, like, like, you know, and away from the studios where, you know, he was not in contact because there were no cell phones, there were none of that, you know, none of those things. And, and as I tell people, I said, if anybody's wearing a pager, it's not Prince, you know what I mean? Like, he doesn't, yeah. he's not the one who has to wear the pager, everybody else wears the pager. Um, so being out in, at the Arboretum with him was such a unique experience and such a quiet experience, really, uh, that was a wow, but in a, in a in sort of a very different way. It was one of those more like transformative type of experiences where you just see, get to see something from someone. And, 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 you know, in the moment, it was one more thing. I don't, and I don't mean to belittle it when I say that, but when you're, when yeah. you're sort of doing things that are constantly like, hey, this is cool, you, you accept it. Just like, you know, it, 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 you know, like raising a kid, you know, every day there's something really kind of amazing, but you remember the moments where they stood up and walked for the first time or their first word, you remember those things. But in fact, every step of the way is amazing. So really working with him, there was never a point where I wouldn't say things were amazing. They always were. Mm -hmm. It just, it's just that certain things stood out and that was one that really stood out to me. And, mm -hmm. um, and having those photos from that time, you know, sort of really pull me, pull me back into it when I was looking through them and, you know, really remembering that experience that that was that was a a wow on sort of a you know a very different level yeah reading in the book about you taking your son back there yeah um, yeah to the same spots was really i think really quite beautiful the way that you you wrote it down um thank you yeah I mean, let's just thank you for that 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 was quite special to read yeah well i i you know, my son, it's interesting. He He's very much into music, and which is great. We share that in common and, and can talk music. And he exposes me to new stuff, and I expose him to stuff. And it's really kind of a great relationship. And it reminds me a little bit of, you know, reminds me a little bit of how Prince and I talked about music, which is cool. And then when he got into Prince, I mean, you know, he got into the, to the old stuff because I had it all. But he also got into the newer stuff. And when Artificial Age came out, he was like, man, this is a great record. And I, I have to say, you know, as someone who's been into Prince for as long as I had, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, it's cool. <laughs> and he um, he said, no, no, listen to this, listen to this. And he would start to play me things to a point where suddenly I'm hearing it, first of all, from his perspective. But also, you know, when I was a kid, I had that opportunity to sit and listen to a record over and over and over again to really burn it into my conscious, into my subconscious. And mm. um and as you get older, you know, there's less time for that. Like, you know, I find myself, well, where, where do I listen to music? In the car. Yeah. Um, sometimes at home, but then, you know, I'll get a phone call or an email or whatever, turn it off and don't turn it back on. So I was suddenly getting a very different perspective on Prince from someone who grew up liking the music, but now had something that was a contemporary to him. And he was really into it and really appreciated it. And it was really, it was very cool. And so there was also a certain amount of, you know, I really would love to have had Prince meet my son and my son meet Prince. I think that it would have been cool after, you know, kind of the years of, of not, you know, like between when he was born and, and, uh, and all uh, Prince came to see him because I think he would have really enjoyed him as a person. And I think my son would have enjoyed Prince as a person and that would have been really cool. So mm. for me, being able to at least do that was um, something I really felt I wanted to do and I, I'm glad I did it. Very glad I did it. Thank you, Steve, so much for your time and thank you for sharing your stories in your book as well. Um, you know, it's really for us, it's, uh, you know, it's just really touching to to read the stories and we can relate to it and it connects to like our experiences of you know how we've experienced Prince through yeah, his music totally. yeah. right, right. well I appreciate that and one of the things that I really wanted to convey and um, I thank my friend um, Michael Van Huffle who I worked with for reminding me of this he said you know because I, I was showing him some of the pieces I was writing them he said you know well, this is great you're giving the information but he says but I I got to tell you when you would go out to Paisley you would be so excited every time and he says you know and after a week of working all those hours you were a little beat down but you came right back the next time ready to go again and he said you you know you always approached it with such you know genuine love for what you were doing mm -hmm. and he says you got to get that in these stories and and i thought about it and i said you know he's right because i did and it was it really was that sort of like hey i grew up wanting to do this yeah, and i got to do it <laughs> yeah. i mean 
and it, it's so amazing uh, that that's the case. And I really wanted to make sure that I, I conveyed the, my, my sense of you know, appreciation for that opportunity and really give a sense of a guy who I, I think a lot of people, you know, they, they don't have that experience of seeing how giving and generous of a person he can be, even when he can be a taskmaster. I mean, you know, anybody who worked for him would never say he wasn't. Yeah. But, you know, he, he did it to himself, too. He, he pushed himself. So he really pulled out of you what you were capable of, even beyond what you thought you could do, which I think is a tremendous, it's a tremendous uh, thing to recognize that in people. It's another one to give them the opportunity, especially as I've come to realize, you know, a guy who didn't have to, didn't have to. Yeah. But pulled in, you know, like, hey, you're the best at this. I'm going to bring you in. You're the best at this. Instead of saying, I see something in you and I want to give you that opportunity. And I want you, I want to work with you to, to make that happen because I be basically because I believe in you, uh, which is. That's one thing we hear time and time again with Prince, with people who worked around him, that he would want to bring out the best in you. Um, Absolutely. That is, that's, that's very beautiful. Mm. Very and that's another thing yeah. that I've taken from your book, Steve, is that, and also from Prince's work, is that ethic as well of, um, you know, maybe you don't know how to do something, but you just do it. And you're going right. to make mistakes, you'll get better. And, you know, and that's like a really powerful message as well that comes through in your book. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I think it's important. It's, it's I, I, like I said, I've learned from that that, you know, wh why would you not dive in all the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, wow. I question that with people sometimes. It's like, why won't you commit all the way? Because it's, oh, I, why not? I mean, in the end, I think in the end, we all want to see that we've done that, that we've worked and we've done it, done everything as hard as we possibly can instead of going like, oh, I wish I had. You know, and it's it's one of the things I think that if I can share anything about him is that he did it himself. He did it himself. He committed everything he had to what he wanted and and made his own, you know, and made his own world out of that. And that, you know, uh, trying to learn that lesson so that you don't find yourself one day wishing you had done things, but that you're happy that you have done things, I think is really important, uh, very important life lesson for anyone. And, and he really kind of slammed that home for anybody who, that worked for him. And I think that anybody who worked for him and, and made it and worked there for a long time, almost said survive, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, they learned that lesson. They learned it and they carried it into the rest of their lives. Everybody I know who worked out there with him have become ex are, are extraordinary people and have become more extraordinary people through learning that lesson and pushing themselves in all aspects of their lives. And I think that's an amazing thing. And you know, That's amazing. Thank you, Steve. Thanks so much. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you on the launch night when, at the gallery. Yes. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. This is gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. I hope I'm not too tired. I'm trying to I'm trying to, <laughs> try to get a day in of like getting it acclimated so I can be awake with everybody else. Yeah. We'll, we'll bring you some coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, coffee. Yes, lots of coffee. Here we go. Okay. All right. Cheers, Steve. Thank, thank you again. Steve. All right, take care. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. There you go. So what did you think about that? Wow, that was incredible. What an amazing guy. Yeah, really cool. And um, I really love like the, the last few things that he was saying about, you know, just put, giving yourself fully to something. I think that's really important. Yeah, the messages that Prince has taught most of the people around him mm. to push themselves, to work hard, strive for better things yeah I had a manager that had this really like funny saying I used to take the mickey out of him because he used to watch Come Dancing and um, when he was talking about things he would say like you're already wearing the spandex like, just go with it <laughs> fantastic <laughs> and I think that's basically what Steve was saying yeah, yeah yeah what I did love about this as well is, is um, the thinking about the beauty of art and music mm. or what comes first art influencing music or music influencing art mm. and you get a sense of both happening yeah you know um, Steve with his expertise with all, all the knowledge that he has and the beauty of what Prince has 
yeah, one of my favourite stories. It didn't come out really, really well on the interview because the audio was a bit uh, interrupted, but it was the story that Steve's put across in his book about this painting uh, effect that he did on a photo of Prince from the Holy River video and Prince coming back, seeing that photo, really loving it and then coming back later yeah. with the track Welcome to the Dawn and saying to him, you inspired me to make this like that's yeah, just absolutely yeah. crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Uh, that was That was great. Cool. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it. Um, it's pretty hard work making a podcast it's the first one it is. and um, <laughs> it's harder than we thought but it's fun as well so yeah really enjoyed that we're going to do some more of these definitely look out for us yeah we'll see you soon okay thank you bye